Hello and welcome to Trash Arts Ticks, Season 3, Episode 3, with myself, Ryan, we got Sam, and we got Jackson. Hey. And so this week, guys, Sam's going to bring us up to speed with everything industry and what's been happening in the world of film this week. And then, Sam actually had the pleasure of interviewing the actress known as Trisha Robinson, who's an American actress, and also she does Without Your Head with Nasty Neil Jones. And so we've got that to look forward to. And then we're going to be discussing... The films that we think are actually going to be pretty cool this year, um, and basically the films that are coming out, hopefully, fingers crossed, providing everything in the world. Um, so without further ado, over to you, Sam. So last week we had a project announcement from Darren Aronofsky, and this week we get another one. Ooh. He's assigned to a project called Adrift. Adrift is um, <clears throat> described as a boat kind of like horror story. It's something that Jared Leto is attached to. He's been trying to make this film for like 10 years. So a horror set on a boat? Yeah, well the description was basically that they, they find this boat and there's like a distress call but there's maybe more to the ghost ship than, you know. Uh, so it's like, there's a kind of interpretations open there. It's based on the book by the guy who uh, wrote The Ring. So again it makes you think, oh. alright, we're talking ghosts, right? Mm. Um, this is a Bloomhouse film, which is kind of, um, kind of cool really because Arnavosky being attached to Bloomhouse Bloomhouse make a hell of a lot of films and to be attached to a few more auteurs kind of helps. And this is, it sounds like it's more straight up horror film that he's done. Mother, more absurdism, Black Swan has a bit of psychodrama in there. This sounds like straight up horror or maybe not. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah, it's just cool that he's doing another film. He hasn't done films yeah. in years, he's announced two. He's still doing the first film we discussed last week, The, the Whale. I think that's what it's called. And the Brendan Fraser dramedy, he's still doing that first because that's like set in one location, he's shooting that in March, and then he'll be going on to this film. It's kind of interesting, like when you hear about directors who haven't done anything in a while and then they come back, it's almost like lockdowns and stuff have kind of, kind of given them time to reflect. And it's like now they're all coming out of the woodwork mm. and the people that want to act more and people that want to direct more. It's Inspiration, cool. you know, it can happen during these times. Yeah, and a, a ghost ship film does sound quite sort of I don't know. It feels like it would it would set the the mood at the moment mm. of the world. I can't remember a, <laughs> like a, a previous ghost film in the last sort of ten years. Is Thirteen Ghosts on a boat? No, Thirteen Ghosts is definitely not. What's on the boat. one that came out in the early noughties, late nineties? Ghost Ship. That yeah, that, one. that probably Terrible makes sense. Film. Terrible film. But that's the last one that I can remember that's actually set on a boat. Well, see, I'm not even sure because I haven't read the book, of course. That it, it could be set way back in the times when you would find ghost ship boats, that kind of scenario, or if it's a more modern set film. So there's lots to learn about adrift, and I guess we'll find out more over the year. Noah Baumbach, who did um, probably mispronounce your name, but Noah Baumbach, who did Marriage Story, he's just signed a big old deal with Netflix. Now his last film, Marriage Story and The Merowitz Story, basically were both Netflix films. So now he signed an overall deal where he's just going to make films for Netflix because they were all critically acclaimed, won Oscars, got nominated for Oscars, so they want to be in the business of him, which is great because he gets to have the freedom to do the stories he wants to do. The first film he's going to do is a film called White Noise. It's by a guy called Don DeLilio, Don DeLilio, Don DeLilio. <laughs> <laughs> who um, one of his books was adopted into Cosmopolitan by uh, David Cronenberg. Yeah, this film is basically about like this poisonous kind of leak and these people being stuck in one environment. It's a satire about consumerism. So again, it's kind of it's a very different angle for what Noah Baumbach usually does, cynical comedies, you know, dramedies, stuff like that. So it's like, okay, cool, this is what he wants to do. He's got Adam Driver involved and he's got Greta Gerwig. So he's already got a cast and they've done a lot of work with uh, Noah Baumbach. So yeah, it could be quite cool. I like his, I've always liked his films. I liked his films way back when he was a squid in the whale, you know. Luca Guadagnino it has a new film. And for some reason, everybody's in the horror business. He's got a horror love story. That's how he's describing it. With uh, Timothy Chamonet, the guy who was in um, Call Me By Your Name, which was directed by Luca. And Taylor Russell, who uh, supposedly was a breakout in Waves. I've not seen the film, but... Good on her for being a breakout. Um, yeah, it's, there's not much t told about it, but it's a ghost love story. And again, it's like, okay, the ghosts are in. <laughs> ghosts are back in. He obviously did the uh, remake of Suspiria. So it's cool that he's still making horror films because he makes a lot of art house films. 
he's supposed to do Scarface. So when this actually is going to be done, who knows? But it seems like everyone's trying to sell horror stories with much smaller casts because they're thinking about what's going on right now, which is good. Yeah, yeah. and it feels like a, a lot of these sound very... Uh... I don't know, like grand, like sort of the 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 seventies horror films that mm. you know we think about quite a lot, uh, quite often. Yeah, that's exciting. Yeah, yeah, and we have one more to add to the list of oh, really? uh, interesting kind of. Don't know if it's horror, but it's still kind of the secludedness of it. Claire Foy, who um, I believe was in The Crown and was recently in the Girl and the Dragon Tattoo sequel, like not Rooney Mara. But um, she's doing an art house film, with, which is a merman infatuation story. So now we've had recently, you know, Shape of Water, a bit of merman love. But this one's set in a lighthouse. And it's more about the psychology and... It sounds like an interesting mix. It comes from the director, um, Gillian... R R I'm so bad at pronouncing names You've picked today. all the names today <laughs> that you can't pronounce. <laughs> Rubespe Rubespe or however... The, I'll put the words on the screen so people can see how it's spelled. <laughs> Essentially, yes, they're doing this art house kind of merman infatuation story. And that sounds really interesting. So again, it's taking something we go, okay, what can we do that's a bit strange and different and keep it with character focus at the same time? So yeah, some cool, cool film announcements. Nice, nice. So um, this week, guys, Sam had the pleasure of interviewing the actress known as Trisha Robinson. She's an American actress. And uh, actually, during the first lockdown um, in America back last year. She actually got involved with Neil Jones who does Without Your Head and does uh, a weekly podcast. And yeah, she's now a presenter on that. So without further ado, over to you Sam for that interview. I'm on Trash Arts Take with Trista Robinson. How are you doing? You well? Yeah, I'm good. How are you? Yeah, I'm doing good. It's uh, been an easy day. It's been all right. All good. Now Trista, you're an actress and you also are a co-host of Without Your Head. Now, what what got you interested in acting? Um, well, um, when I was in middle school, I I did a play. I was in The Wizard of Oz, and I was a munchkin and a flying monkey. And um, I just had a really fun time. And I remember everyone on stage and everyone in the audience just smiling and being so happy. Um. And then that really struck me. Uh, and I also had an aunt who I really admired, who was a stage actor in, in Pittsburgh. Okay, and what was your uh, first um, first performance outside of like um, theaters, like so first film? Oh, my first film. Well, I actually kind of, um, it's funny because my first uh, real lead role in a film, uh, I played a deaf woman in a movie called The Human Race, and the uh, director has since become a great friend of mine, uh, Paul Huff, and I was just thinking of him when you called because uh, your accent sounds a lot like his. Oh, is, is he British then? Mm-hmm, yeah, his father's John Huff, oh, okay. uh, who did like a lot of Hammer films. Oh, nice. So, so uh, you, like, I was having a look over your IMDb. You've done a lot of short films and you've done a lot of feature films. I wanted to talk first about the short films. Um, just a few that came from my looking at over the, the Summoner, Queen of the Dead. What was it like being in those short films? And there, was there a particular performance that you really enjoyed doing? I'm sorry, uh, I didn't catch the tail end of the question. Was there a particular performance that was? Sorry. <laughs> And um, like a particular short film that you enjoyed doing, like like a performance that s sticks with you. Yeah, thanks for asking. So um, those two short films, uh, both of those filmmakers have become great friends of mine, and I've worked with them multiple times. So The Summoners uh, was for Christian Ackerman. Um, and I also contributed to a book that he did. He compiles um, essays from horror creators and um, he has a whole series of books. But um, anyway, so that short was really fun um, and proposed some challenges because uh, I was I, I become possessed in the film, and so I have these whiteout lenses, but I become possessed during a seance that we're having. So there's candles everywhere, so there's <laughs> fires every fire everywhere, and I'm blind, and I'm attacking these other young people. So it, it was kind of a 
uh, cumbersome uh, job, but fun. And um, and uh, Queen of the Dead, that filmmaker is uh, Justin B. Head, who's a friend of mine as well. And um, that was super, super fun. That was, I think, my second film with both of those filmmakers. So I had worked with Justin before on a short film called Having Your Cake. And... Um, that was a completely different character and a completely different story. So it was really, really cool to do something with the same filmmaker and um, something so radically different. And I really had no idea how it was going to turn out. But I I was really uh, proud of both of those projects. And that really stuck with me as well, um, just because it was a very experimental film. I feel like um, the other film was sort of a cut and dry story. Uh, I'm gonna get possessed, I'm gonna attack these girls, it's like a six minute short. Mm. This was much more experimental and I really had to just in a lot. And every time I've done that with him, it has worked out very well. Was this the, correct me if I'm wrong, but was this the one that was screened at Without Your Heads recently? Yes, yes. Having your cake and uh, Queen of the Dead both screened um, oh, yeah, for those watch parties. Yeah, I think I caught the if I'm is Queen of the Dead the black and white one. Yes, yes. Yeah, a really nice style to it. A lot of atmosphere. It was cool. Thank you. Yeah, those guys are pretty impressive. I'm I'm so proud of him, and I can't wait for him to make his first feature because he just keeps evolving. He's made a lot of shorts and I think every time he makes a short film, they're better and better. Do you think you'll be involved with that? I don't know. I hope he'll hire me. <laughs> I, I, I don't want to be presumptuous, but I would love to. Fingers crossed then. Thank you. So I was looking at some of your uh, feature work. Um, one film that I just, I have to ask because like, Obviously, you do a lot of horror films, but this film sounds like one of those kind of what I assume was hopefully a fun B movie, um, Jurassic City. Could you tell us about that? Oh wow! Yeah, that's a that is. I just so Sean Kane is um, a friend of mine, and uh, so I've had some smaller roles in some of his films. So yeah, that was a fun job just because. He's a really great guy and, and a dear friend. So I always love... Um, you'll see that's a theme in, in my conversation and, and in my work. I, I just love um, good people. That's a big priority for me. So I love working with Jay- Sean. Rather, That's another person that I've worked with multiple times. I think that may have been my second film with him as well. And um, another person that I hope just keeps getting uh, bigger and better jobs. So, as you were saying there, so it's important for you to um, to be drawn towards like working with good people. Is that more important than necessarily the the, the perfect role? It's a really good question, and it's something I've been asking myself <laughs> more and more these days. When you're an actor, you don't always have the luxury of being um, so picky, right? Especially when you're starting out. However, these days the uh, obviously the polit- political climate has been so intense and more and more my priority is to uh, be a good person, right? Yeah. I love making art, I love making good art, but there's nothing more important than being a good person and uh, I love showing up for good people and um, I question myself all the time, you know, when I'm working on a project, is this a good person? And that's become, that's definitely come to the forefront of my mind and heart more than any other time in my life. Um, so I think, I think it is more important nowadays than just taking a job. Um, it's to, and honestly, that's part of why I've loved um, being a part of Without Your Head. I love being able to showcase good people, lift good people up, Uh, We hear a lot of stories about bad people um, in life and in the business. And and I want, I think there are just as many good people that are talented as bad people. And I want those people to have more and more opportunities. No, I completely agree with you. There's like, it's it's, it's it's an awkward feeling to work with someone who, you don't want to give them a platform when they're a bad person, politically or sociology, whatever their kind of mindset's at that, that doesn't fit with what you feel is right. It just feels like, should I be working with this person? 
Yeah, it's a real attack of conscience. And the thing is, it can be tricky because obviously you can't agree with the ideals of all collaborators. Like, sets employ lots of people, Mm. you know. Um, But it's definitely something that is uh, something I'm thinking about more and more every day, really. No, I think it's a, it's a good thing to think about. Is there any, like, would there be a dream role for you or kind of the sort of performances you 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 prefer and the kind of, the, the yeah, sorry, like the key role you'd want to do, like dream role? Oh, uh, that's a good question. You know, I did um, mention uh, Paul Huff and I, I did that film, um, The Human Race, and I found playing a deaf woman really really rewarding and educational and i i've been thinking lately i'd love to play a a blind person because it's just something i know nothing about it and that i probably take for granted constantly and uh i think it might be just as rewarding as uh that experience so it's almost like uh taking the empathy approach towards performance that's the entire approach i take to my life it's the only Uh, It's the biggest part of what makes me an actor. I'm a really hypersensitive person. So, uh, yeah, I I take it uh, to everything. It's the most important uh, thing to me, which is kind of funny because um, I have a lot of actor friends and uh, and I know some people that just aren't empathetic. and, And, you know, it's not their fault. I'm not blaming them. People are built differently. Um, But it always makes me wonder how they're such great actors because they are they're just as um talented if not more so than myself and, and most of them are, are more successful so i wonder how they do it i wonder how they turn it on um i don't have that ability for for me like i i'm just walking around with a genuine sensitivity i always find with horror as well like it's one of those genres that really if you if you want to make it work it's all about empathy I think so. I, I think it's such a visceral genre, and I'm such a visceral person. So I, I think that's a good fit. <laughs> so let's talk a bit about um, your co-hosting with, Without Your Heads. When did that start? So um, I had a film, Echoes of Fear, that was on um, the festival circuit um, from 2019 to 2020, and Neil caught that at Buffalo Dreams and um, uh, then we have mutual friends Sophia Cassiola and Michael Epstein and so then I shot a feature with them out here in California and Neil came out to work on that as well so he had already interviewed me for his podcast for Echoes he had done um, an audio podcast and then he had us on when he switched to video for a Q&A with the full cast and crew. And then we had connected on this other project as well after that. And then he kind of just kept inviting me on the show. And then he just asked me to be on uh, regularly, which was obviously very nice of him. Did you think that was something you were going to be moving towards with a career, like being a co-host on a, a video cast? No, 100% no. Um... I obvi- it, it all happened around the same time as the pandemic. It's like, I don't think like I should go back on and talk about my work again. And I was like, well, let's talk about um, people of color and horror. Like, that seems like a more appropriate thing. And he let me, like, book a guest for that who's now part of the network. And um, so we just made it more of a roundtable discussion. And nice. I think from there, he just uh, let me... Uh, just participate more and kept inviting me to participate more and at the same time I had shoots that just kept getting pushed because of COVID so I had all of this time you know Mm. and at first I thought I wouldn't like it that I mean I was not that I wouldn't like it I was grateful for it but I was I'm a little shy so I I don't think I was fully um I, I was doing it more uh, for my friend Neil, not necessarily, I thought I might be awkward on camera every week, but the more I did it, the more I realized it's not really about me, and I, I'm quite comfortable, like, 
learning and listening and highlighting other people's worthy work. Mm. Um, so I'm, I'm enjoying it way more than I had anticipated. It's a great sur surprise and studying people's filmographies has uh has been wonderful and, and um listening to people's stories and it's been great it's been wonderful i'm very grateful do you have a favorite that you've um, been involved with interviewing oh um well uh, i did um really find guinevere turner very um inspirational i think she's so smart and uh, I'm a big fan of her work. I also loved having my friend Justin B. Head on the show, and um, who I had mentioned earlier. And um, I guess I'm a little partial to my own collaborators. Uh, Brian and uh, Lawrence Avenue Bradley, they're the filmmakers of Echoes of Fear. And um, we had them on, and they're some of my best friends, along with uh, Mark Savage, who's a collaborator of mine. So I'm super... Um, <laughs> Uh, super unfair, but um, I have been able to have some of my dear friends on the show, so that's been special for me. That's awesome. Now, you said that obviously COVID got in the way with some films that were coming up, but what is next? What were you working on or what are you now looking to work on? Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks. Um, so I've been doing some auditions. I've been doing some self-tapes and um, uh, some of that from home, which is kind of exciting. I also have um, a, a, a Brian and Lo, who I just mentioned, uh, who did Echoes of Fear. We are trying to get something off the ground, um, which is also very exciting. I can't um, talk too much about it. Mark Savage, who I just mentioned, uh, who I did Purgatory Road with, we're also trying to get something else off the ground. Um, I worked with Linnea Quigley not that long ago on something um, that should be coming out pretty soon. I have a Western that will be coming to uh, most streaming services in the spring. Nice. And I've shot a third of a of a movie with my favorite title. It's called uh, Killer Babes and the Frightening Film Fiasco. Um, and that's with a bunch of women that I uh, admire as well, including Linnea as well. So um, we've shot a third of that, and we're hoping to be able to finish it up when it's safe. And I just have a little bit more on... Um, that movie I mentioned with Michael Epstein and Sofia Cassiola, a couple uh, days uh, left on that to work on uh, when we all feel comfortable working on that. So plenty coming up in the future when things are a bit easier then. Yeah, hopefully I don't want to drink anything, but yeah, I have, I'm super lucky to have a really great uh just really great friends that I love working with and we're all like minded and I think that's really important um yeah so I I feel very excited I completely agree with you like I I I, ha I get into that habit of the people I work with I, I want them to be friends and I want to be with good people so it's always good to hear that like generally speaking people in the indie scene are in the same mindset yeah for me I've been so lucky in, in, in that way, I can't uh, say enough about how fortunate I've been. Yeah, I've got great friends because when you're shooting like indie projects, a lot of times the hours are long. Uh, you know, it's hard work. Uh, you're very vulnerable. Um, yeah, so I, I, I have uh, some people that I just trust implicitly that I want to work with over and over. Well, that's awesome. Well, thank you very much for joining us, Trista. And I hope everything's going to go very well for you this year. And yeah, thank you. Thank you. Likewise. And I really, um, I enjoyed Monstrous Disunion too on the watch, uh, on the screening uh, that Neil did for you guys. Oh, thank you very much. I'll let, I'll let uh, Jackson know, the director. He'll be happy. Yeah, thank you. Right. Uh, have a lovely day and hopefully we'll get you back on the podcast sometime in the future. You too. I'd love that. Thank you again. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. So thanks for that, Sam. Really cool. You're welcome. Interesting. Um, so guys, what we wanted to do this week is we wanted to kind of look at the films that are coming out in 2021. And um, we decided to pick 10 of 
the films that we're kind of anticipating the most, really. When um, we say we, you mean me and you. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I could not be bothered to do the research. So this, so this is, is all on you guys. <laughs> this is all fresh for Jack, so um, you, you'll, you'll know some of them as we go through. But uh, yeah, so obviously some of them are going to be from last year, which were pushed. Yes. But ultimately, they still haven't come out, so it still counts, in my opinion. Um, and the first one that I only really found out about recently, and it was due to come out on the 18th of December last year, but it's actually called The Father, and it's starring Anthony Hopkins and uh, Olivia Coleman, and it's basically based on the 2012 French play, so I could pronounce this wrong, Les Paris, Paris? Um, and the whole idea of it is it's, I imagine Anthony Hopkins' character is playing an aging man who's suffering from severe memory loss, and Olivia Coleman is his daughter, um, and she basically comes to live with him to take care of him. Um, I don't know, it's a very simplistic storyline, yeah. um, but that whole idea, I, I think there's just something really nice about it, and I know when we were speaking about it earlier, Sam, there's loads of hype that Anthony Hopkins could get nominated for an Oscar and stuff with this film, and just to see Anthony Hopkins again back in a, a leading role where he's the focal point, uh, there's just something that really interests me about that. Well, um, the film uh, first screened in Sundance back in January 2020, and they were already talking about like the Oscar buzz on their two performances. So it's kind of like crazy that they actually carried over all that attention to this point to actually finally release it. And yeah, this, the buzz is still there. I think Anthony Hopkins could still get a nomination. I think he was... No, he wasn't nominated last year for the Pope one. No. So he could potentially still get a nomination. I don't think uh, he'll get a win. Because there's other bigger films in that oh, yeah. sense, but it's even a nomination at his age. Like, you know, you think about the roles that he does. The, the Pope one was probably the last one, in, or the first one in a long time where he's played a like the serious focal point. Yeah, yeah. Whereas before, it's kind of like if you think of Transformers, he's a side character. You know, he's always kind of there to steer the story along. Yeah. Even in Westworld, like I know it's a TV show, but he's kind of. In oh, it. he'll take the paycheck for the holiday. He's he's admitted that. <laughs> yeah, but it's still cool. To see, you know, uh, I don't mean this disrespectfully, but an aging actor come back and head up a, a role in it. Yeah, Hopkins definitely. In his own right, it's a brilliant actor. Yeah, yeah. He's done some terrible stuff, but I think and it's, it's kind of mad to see Olivia Coleman, who you know, uh, I, I first knew as Sophie from Peep Show. Yeah, uh, working with Anthony Hopkins <laughs> now, like that's that's. Well, not only that, she's an Oscar winner herself, yeah. isn't she? So yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, no, I know, I know, yeah, obviously, it'd be but... quite a recent nomination if she got it. Yeah, it's cool. Um, so the next film is The Northman. So this is a film directed by Robert Eggers. Um, he's the director that actually has done The Witch and most recently The Lighthouse. Um, and it's kind of, it's basically a, revi oh, a reviking, a Viking revenge film. Yeah. Um, you know a bit more about this than I do. It's got Nicole Kidman. Is it Alan and Bill? I can't even pronounce his name. Alex and Bill Skarsgård are in it, who, um, Alex Skarsgård is, they're both actors, of course. But Bill Skarsgård, for most people, that's Pennywise. So mm. they're both, be, they're both in it. I believe Alex Skarsgård is actually the lead. William Defoe's in it. Um, <clears throat> it's quite, there's a lot of reunion. There's Anna Joy from um, The Witch, she's in it as well. I think Ethan Hawke's in it. And um, it just sounds like, because the guy's like, he's so dedicated to the design of the film. Mm. And when he works in period pieces, he gets everything right. And this is supposed to be a bigger scale film that he wrote with um, an Icelandic poet. And Bjork's in it as a witch. It's, it's that kind of crazy cast full of brilliant people, <coughs> the great character actors in a period piece, which I don't know is leaning towards fantasy with it, but it sounds like it probably is going to be a bit broader if there's a witch in it, you know? Yeah. I mean, I just don't know with uh, Rob Eggers. Yeah, that's it. Be... With his films, like, I, I've not personally seen The Witch, but from what I've heard you guys say about it, there's obviously a, a real weird sort of magical element to it. Um, but The Lighthouse, is it's almost like a period piece, and it's more about the psychology of the, the characters. Well, the, the Witch is quite... Um, is a period piece as well yeah. and is, is very sort of historically accurate in the way that they spoke and the way that they like acted and behaved he, he's just he always does well seems to we'll, we'll yeah. see in the future but he's he seems to always like focus on on 
how people behaved in the past. He seems to have a real interest in period pieces as well. Because yeah. before he was writing The Northman, he was very interested in doing his own version of Nosferatu. So like the guy is just dedicated to the past. And yeah, so it's always exciting to see what he's coming up with. And I don't, again, whether it comes out this year, it's finished production. They shot it, I think they shot it in Ireland. Oh, when, nice. When you were in Ireland. Um, so whether it comes out by the end of this year, could it be that they try and push it as an Oscar film? I don't know. They still, he's, I don't know, like they want him to be an Oscar kind of guy, but he always does something a bit more interesting where he's not playing to everyone. So yeah, whether it comes out, We'll see. I think his films sort of stand alone in their their own right, don't yeah, they? Yeah, they're going to be remembered for a long time. Yeah, though. like but even when you think of the lighthouse, yeah. that's that still sort of scars me with some of the scenes. You're like, oh, okay. <laughs> and it feels so real, even though there's uh, like the language that they're using because of the you know past, um, you know the, the the way that people spoke in the past. Um, and despite that being kind of alienating, you still feel like you're watching something that's more real than than the sort of uh, I don't know modernized historical period pieces. Hmm. Then the next one, so the third one on our list, um, is Don't Look Up. So this is a film directed by Adam McKay, and um, basically he's done uh, what was it, The Big Short, Big Short, Anchorman, yep. Vice. He's done great comedies. Yeah. And um, this is actually one that's starring Leonardo DiCaprio, Jennifer Lawrence, and Meryl Streep, just to name a few. Yeah. Like, this has got a cast that is just stacked. massive. Yeah, absolutely stacked. And um, it's kind of a, a satirical piece. Um, and basically, the, the idea and the premise that we've kind of understood from it is it's a, well, Jennifer Lawrence's character and Leonardo DiCaprio's character are scientists who discover that there's a comet coming to the Earth. Yeah. And they have to try and go and convince people that this is happening and warn them. Um, so, yeah, I'm really interested to see how that plays out as a satire. The thing is, he's been on such a like great streak for so long. And he's really got that mind on what's going on right now. So it's, yeah. Adam it's, McKay. Yeah. 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 And it's a Netflix release as well. So we know it's definitely going to come out this year. <laughs> but, yeah, I love his films. I love all of his films. I love his new style of how he does things now. And I just think it's it's a great idea for what's just going on, you know, what's happened, really, yeah. you know. And yeah, that cast is, if only I can remember all their names, but there's so many names in the film, it's just ridiculous. I think Chris Evans isn't it, isn't it? I think so. Yeah. I can't remember. But yeah, I, I feel like sometimes with you can't slap people around the face with these ideas of, look how stupid you're being. Mm. But you can throw it in with satire. And satire is always powerful in that sense. I and mean, we did a whole episode on satire, didn't we? Yeah. I think so, yeah. <laughs> what, <laughs> I'm, what I'm interested to see is like Leonardo DiCaprio in a bit more of a a comical role, I suppose. <clears throat> like, and I, I don't know, it's not going to be straight up slapstick, but the nearest sort of... I know he kind of plays a really quirky character as uh, Jordan Belford in The Wolf of Wall Street. But I, I imagine this is going to be a bit more... Um, Candy from I don't know, I, I kind Chim of got like more that of really a... weird, like, oh, you know, come along, we're gonna do this, and a bit like random and quirky as opposed to. I was thinking more Once Upon a Time in Hollywood because that is a yeah, comedy that's role. True. Yeah, yeah, that is a good role, um, but it'd be nice to see him back as well. Yeah, yeah, and then the next film, Blonde. So, Blonde is basically. It's, uh, well, from what we understand... It's, it's a fever dream film. Yeah, it's like, um, the best way to describe it is Andrew Dominic is the director and he said he wanted to do, it's about Marilyn Monroe, but it's not a biopic. It's more like a, as he described it, a Polanski mental breakdown sort of film, which already makes it way, way more interesting for me personally. And Andrew Dominic made two of the most underrated films the last 20 years, Assassination of Jesse James, and Killing Them Softly. These two are brilliant films. He hasn't made a film since Killing Them Softly, and that was way back in 2012. They both had Brad Pitt in it, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, they did. And Brad Pitt actually produced Blonde because he wanted to see this film being made. He's, uh, Andrew Dominic has been trying to make this film for like five years, gone through several different actresses, lost money. But then Netflix stepped in, and they're paying for it. So again, we know it's being released this year. It was wrapped years ago. And it stars um, Anna de Amar. Is that? Amas. There we go. 
Well, I, I think what's cool about um, Anna Diamas is, I don't know about you guys if you agree with this, but she seems to have just popped up like overnight in, yeah, well, yeah. in the last couple of years. She's just, and now she's landed all these big roles. Like, that's not the only film that she's in in our list. Um, but I, I did read yesterday that um, she went in or went through real intensive um, yeah, I read that. voice yeah, yeah. coaching to try and kneel down like Marilyn she's Monroe's. Cuban. Yeah, she's Cuban. She was in... Um, uh, what's Knives the, Out. That's the one. She's the main oh, nurse character. yeah, yeah. So it's, quite, it's an exciting, different kind of way to do it. And the description of it is just my kind of film. I can't wait for it. I'm waiting years for it. And I like the idea of it being a bit like a fever dream film. It's it's, it's not going to just follow from A to B. There's going to be trippy points within Whoa. it and the demise almost of Marlon Monroe as a person. To yeah, the and if you think about Assassination Jesse James, it's not yeah. your traditional biopic and that is just outstanding. So I know, Yeah, a lot of Assassination of Jesse James, not actually from Jesse James's perspective. No, it's more from the other dude. Yeah. Um, so that leads us on to the next one. I'm sure you've heard this one. Jack? Dune. Dune? Dune. So I keep calling it Dune, Dune. but it's Dune. D-U-N-E. Well, yeah, no, I, I, I know, but it's it's easier to say that way, isn't it? D- Dune. I struggle. Um, Dune. Th- Dune. This is directed by um, Dennis Villeneuve, and uh, he's the director of Arrival. He also did Blade Runner and 2049. So... Pretty well established. Both them films, Brilliant. Uh, I enjoy. Brilliant sci-fi directors. Yeah, exactly. And this is obviously a sci-fi in itself. Yeah, yeah. And you got um, Timothy Chalamet, Rebecca Ferguson, and Oscar Isaac, which is just a few of them. Like stacked again. <laughs> this is fully loaded with like very very well known actors actresses. And um, and I don't know like with with Dune. I know Star Wars originally took a lot of inspiration from Dune as in the books. Yeah, yeah. And um, so I'm really interested to see how they kind of, well, how they portray this. I know it was meant to come out in December and then it got pushed. Now it's meant to come out in October, so still a good number of months away. But it wow. just—it seems like a really—it seems like it could be one of the big blockbusters yeah, of the yeah. year. Well, this I don't know. I, I I worry that June is a bit unmakeable. I mean, it, Lynch tried, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The thing is, like this guy, this is his dream project. So it's not like he's taking it as a job, and everything he's done has been like beyond brilliant mm. it's in a weird battle with HBO um, I don't know, I remember what it's called Max HBO Max with HBO Max um, they're obviously saying right it's definitely coming out this year it's going to be out on October on HBO Max legendary currently like no we'll sue you if you do that so whether it's actually going to come out this year or if they get pushed again we'll see even though it's completed it's all done it's supposed to come out I, I, I think Dune because of the other films he's done there's potential. I don't understand Dune's storyline whatsoever. It's ne- I watched the Lynch one. It's his worst film. I, I just... But the good, he's a good director. <laughs> it's putting hope. Because it's nice when you get a massive, like, intelligent franchise that works. You know? Like what he did with Blade Runner. Mm. Or what they eventually did with the Ape films. So to yeah. see Dune going in that direction would be awesome. It's just really hard to say when... The story my, yeah, my sense. only experience of that, that that story is from the David Lynch film. I've yeah, not read it. It's awful. Awful. Does he not like hit the nail on the head with it? Or No, he admittedly said though, like he went to, that was the lowest point and it was only up from there and he made Blue Velvet. So and that's one of his better, <clears throat> much better films. Good way to bounce back then, I suppose. <laughs> <clears throat> um so yeah, then the next one, I think me and you Sam agreed on this one. More so because I think out of all the comic book films that are coming out this year, this one is kind of, it could be a redemption arc, but also for us it's kind of the most appealing comic book film. It's the most The Suicide Squad. Yeah. Um, so one of the major reasons that I think it could be quite good is it's James Gunn, who's a director, hmm. and he does, in my personal opinion, two of the best Marvel films in Guardians of the Galaxy 1 and 2. Um, so he's been brought into this, and they've kind of managed to keep some of the cast members from the original one. The tw- it was it twenty fifteen, and so you've still got your Margot Robbie, and you still got your Viola Viola Di- Davis. Yeah. yeah, and with the addition, I didn't know this, but Sylvester Stallone's in it. Yeah, he's got like a small role. You got John Cena, Peter yeah. Capaldi's in it, Pete Davidson's in it, Taiki, you know, from um, what we do in the shadows, he's in it. 
Idris Elba is in it. Everybody's in it. And the thing is, it's got such a random cast. And I don't know Suicide Squad from Batman. You know, I don't remember any of the Suicide Squad stuff. The film's terrible, but I get there's a bunch of characters that don't really work being put together to go and do a job for the government. Yeah. And that sounds more like what this film's trying to be, which goes, oh, that could be fun. And I'm not a massive fan of James Gunn. I've watched all of his earlier films. They're all right. Guardian Galaxy is his best film. Don't bother the second one. Second one's good. I heard Jackson's review and that gave me my opinion on it. But um, I'm still open to this because this is something that he's wanted to do as well. He wanted to do The Suicide Squad. Hmm. He was offered a lot of things. He was like, no, I'd love to do that story. And it's rated R, which means at least they're not trying to broaden how far they can go with the crazy kind of chaotic carnage sort of madness. And it's like they're like a group who have to go and take down something in South America. Is that the story? I'm not sure what the um, synopsis is for the Suicide Squad, but it's probably going to be very similar in the sense as what the comics were and yeah, like yeah. what the, the first film was. And the whole idea of it is you've got a bunch of criminals that there's something that happens and then the government basically brings these criminals together and sort of says, we'll reduce your time yeah. or whatever if you help us. Where they went wrong, in my personal opinion, with the 2015 version is that it was just really convoluted and the story just got wrapped up in itself too much. It's like, I think it's Viola Davis's character. She's the um, the head of the government, isn't yeah. she? She's the one that like sort of militarizes the Suicide Squad. And she brings, um, oh, what's her name? Is it, what's her name? Is it Cara Delevingne? Yeah, I think so, yeah. So from the first one. And she uses her as... Um, well, like one of the ones for the Suicide Squad, but actually she turns against her. She's the big villain it's at the, the end. It's the worst edited major studio film. Not only the editing, seen. it's just the story. It's like, well, if this is a, po- a person that's high up in the government, why are they bringing someone like that in who's deliberately going to turn against it? Like, it's surely a, you get a background it, it, The thing check. is, Suicide Squad is a victim of studio interference because Marvel were doing well and then they, people weren't reacting as well to Batman versus Superman. And because of that course correction, it fucked up the film. Also, David Ayer is not a good director. Whereas James Gunn, having created freedom of something like this, you're like, okay, it's going to be interesting at least. And it's a lot of comedy actors in there. And that makes you go, okay, we're going for a lighter thing with this. Whereas the other one was a lot of either serious actors or TV actors and a couple of big names. Yeah. And even Will Smith wasn't doing the wisecracking Will Smith, you know, Mendel. Yeah, he, but like, even though he wasn't, he was still one of the best things. Out of yeah, the first yeah, one. definitely. Like, and, and what you could probably guarantee about the Suicide Squad, so James Gunn's one, is it'll have a banging soundtrack. We'll see. So the next film, you'll know this one, Jack. No you, Time you to think Die. This every time. Oh yeah, you mentioned this. <laughs> so I'm really interested with this. It's frustrating. I'm a massive Bond fan, and considering I think what Spectre came out in 2015. That's a long time. So I know when we did our James Bond segment um, before Christmas, I think we did it in November, didn't we? Um, <clears throat> one of the things that we picked up on was that since Bond first started their franchise in 1963 with Dr. No, and um, there's this is the longest duration between Bond films ever. So it'll be going on six years, won't it? And that's crazy. Like, I, I'm just craving Bond. But also... <laughs> <laughs> that could totally be misinterpreted. <laughs> Inch. Um, I'm really interested as well because it's got the true detective yeah, yeah. creator. Everything he's a director. Done. Kerry Fuginaga is like a brilliant director. And it's kind of like a crazy option as well. It's a bit unsafe to go for. <clears throat> and I, I, you know, Bond is fun. And Daniel Craig has been the best of the Bonds recently. So it's like, all right, I want to see his final film. So it had to be in the top 10, even though it should have been out last year and they should have just put it on a streaming site. But nonetheless, like, well, hopefully... There's been loads of mess-ups, really, hasn't yeah, there? Because yeah. then it was due to come out in April, and now because of the whole HBO Max thing, it's pushed again. And it... Well, it's that's not... It's, um, well, it so got it pushed is. again. Yeah, yeah. And it's just like, oh, okay, right. So just release it in October and I, like you say, you're going to do it and then... Let's be having you. The frustration starts to come up when you look at the films. <laughs> Just release it. Well, three, at least three of films on our list out of the ten are due for October releases. Yes. It's interesting. Which leads us nicely on to our <laughs> nice segue. Um, 
to our... So then you fucked it up. <laughs> <laughs> Leading us nicely on to our next October release, Halloween Kills. Yeah. yeah this is so the... you know this one, Jack? I do know this one. This is the one that I, I'm excited about, yeah. They've got like a, I like the the new approach of this one because obviously the first one had to retread old ground, so people kind of knew the you know who Michael. I Myers suppose was. it's bringing people back in exactly, and also introducing it yeah, to yeah, the yeah. audience in a very subtle way. Whereas this one, they've kind of described as the sense of what happens in that panic afterwards, and obviously with things that have happened recently, that's quite an interesting way to go. Plus, John Carpenter and Jamie Lee Curtis have both called it a masterpiece, and sure they're involved, but that's quite high praise. And it's apparently a very big old gore fest. And the a lot more blood and stuff. Yeah, because yeah. the it's not the most glorious first film. It's more about the impact of him being there. But we have to remember where we've left the characters. He's just got out of a burning house. He still wants to kill her. He's going to be angry. Very angry. <laughs> <laughs> not that he's angry anyway, but <clears throat> just next level anger. Yeah. Yeah. Stress knots in his neck and everything. <laughs> Now, as we discussed before, there's like part two and then part three is already completed. And there was talk originally about releasing them quite close to each other. And then a few weeks. Yeah, whether this will happen, there was even talk about it being moved closer. So it's away from Halloween release and more of a summer release. So Halloween Kills comes out sooner and then Halloween ends in well, October. More, more to get away from Bond. But I don't think they'll do that. Jason Bloom has made very clear that this will be released in October this year. It will not be pushed, even if there's a pandemic, which means it will come out on VOD. Mm. So I wish I think in, you know, I'd love to watch Halloween in the cinema. It's kind of like the hope of the first film I can see in the cinema right into later in this year. But at the same time, there's only how long you can hold that interest before it just kind of feels like it just release it, you know? That's what I worry about a lot of the films that have been pushed. Bond is a brilliant example of that in the sense that how many times are you going to push it before people start losing interest? Mm. It's like, well, it's never going to come out. I can't be arsed with it. Yeah. So even when it does come out, you're pushing for a cinema release, but then actually, because you keep pushing, people are just not going to go to the cinema anyway. Oh, well, I'll just wait anyway. I've waited this long. Yeah. yeah. Um, so now I think with Halloween Kills, like hopefully it still comes out in October. And um, as far as I'm aware, Halloween ends, the release date hasn't changed from... October this year either no. but that's probably going to be subject to change which will be interesting because mm -hmm. like even if they bring that to next summer or something depending on like what films are coming out in 2022 summer 2022 so <clears throat> Sam you mentioned this one yeah. which is the unbearable wit of massive talent which actually is kind of really interesting the director is not really that well known I'm probably going to butcher his last name, but it's Tom Gormican. Gormican, is that right? I have no idea. So Tom Gormican, sorry Tom if you're listening. And um, <laughs> yeah, it's starring Nicolas Cage. And this is, like Sam was telling me about the synopsis of this and it's actually a bit mental. Yeah, it's basically like, it's Nick, it's, it's meta. So it's Nick Cage playing Nick Cage, whose career isn't going very well. And essentially like he keeps doing all the bad films uh, he's got a doppelganger that's always like, from the doppelganger from the 90s, he's always like having a go at him about it. And his daughter gets kidnapped by the cartel, who then force him to redo the scenes. It all just sounds like a whole lot of madness. <laughs> and the thing is, Nick Cage is on a mad year. He's got some crazy films coming up. And of all the films of the potential, you know, like, where could it go? That's the one that is exciting. It's not necessarily maybe the best one. He's got an art house film with a Japanese director that's playing Sundance. That could be a lot better for him. But him playing him, he did it so well with, you know, adaption. So it's like, I, I, you know, it's, it goes either way with Nick Cage, but he's got a big, exciting year. There's so many things he's doing. This is the year of Nick Cage. Yeah, and so that's, that's that every like, year. That sounds like <laughs> the, the, a good kind of film for Nick Cage because, mm. like, you put him in the right kind of film um, with the right kind of director, and he's incredible. You put him, you know, in a in a natural, naturalistic, like, uh, you know, uh, ordinary kind of scenario film. And he's too much for the too much to handle, really. Yeah, so yeah. exactly what Sam said earlier. Yeah. <laughs> it's the thing. It is it is the only way with Nick Cage. And the thing is, there's a great comedy cast with him as well. You got Tiffany Haddish, isn't it? And she's always brilliant. Um, I believe Pedro Pascal, isn't it, as the cartels? You know, there's my more doppelganger. Of a, in, 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you say so, right? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, essentially, yeah, the um, it, it feels like it's going more of a comedy angle. And yeah, it'd be interesting to see what film scenes they choose. Because I've heard the old snake-skinned coats back on from Wild at Heart, so... <laughs> We'll see. I can imagine them doing like a face-off scene. I imagine there's definitely or like even one off. from Conair. We'll see. And the title as well: the unbearable weight of massive talent. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> he, has he got a hand in writing it, or someone else wrote it? Someone else wrote it about it. Okay, him. I was going to say like uh, it'd be a bit unusual if he had had a hand in writing it, and it's like, yeah, I'm a massive talent. Like <laughs> that was a uh, Tommy Wasu. You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Nicholas Cage pulls a Tommy Wasu. It sounds horrible. <laughs> yeah, it does, it does. Um, and then the last film on our list is Spiral. Um, and Spiral is basically a spin-off of the Saw franchise. So um, what they've done is they've actually brought back in the director from Saw 2, 3 and 4, who is Darren Lynch Bozeman. And um, yeah, it's been written by Chris Rock and he wanted to take a, a slightly different look and feel on the Saw franchise. And uh, it has, obviously, Chris Rock and Samuel L. Jackson as the, the leads. And they're two detectives who are investigating um, basically a series of murders. And uh, basically, they then find themselves at the mercy of a killer who's reminiscent to Jigsaw. So, I think one thing that's interesting with that is, is they're killing cops. It's a yeah. serial killer that's killing cops. Uh. So for Chris Rock to write that, it makes you go, all right, then. I'm a bit more interested. Chris Rock, obviously, being a comedian but a very political comedian who's yeah. always talked about cops and stuff like that in his stand-up. So to him to take it to a horror franchise that's got a bit stale, that's why I wasn't, I'm, you know, saw I'm always a bit, okay, maybe, but this sounds like a good edge on it. And then to throw Samuel L. Jackson in, who's obviously a much more ageing cop, he's not going to be, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm intrigued. I'm intrigued. There's yeah. been a lot of um, good comedies by, uh, good horrors, sorry, by comedians recently yeah, as well. Yeah, and, yeah. And it seems to be a trend where uh, perhaps it's it's the sort of thing of timing. If you can time a joke well, you can time a scare well. Well, if you think if comedy is about sometimes having a conversation about something as well, then horror like is the is this side by side, you know? It's yeah. the parallel. Yeah. It's almost like if you think about comedians in general, a lot of them other than maybe comedians that do one-liners, but if you think of a majority of them, they're always kind of looking at something that's social or you know political, and they're taking a comedic spin on it. Mm. Uh, I think of like Russell Hard, for example, whenever he does his uh, <laughs> Russell Hard show or whatever on Sky, yeah. <laughs> he's always doing about them like political segments and stuff, and then puts a, a spin in its comedy. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas actually, you know, you could actually take that whole segment and make it a lot more serious and darker and play with it in a different slight like way. Well, if we look at the guy who obviously kind of launched this attitude with Jordan Pill. Yeah, the yeah. appeal was heavily political at times and also dark comedy and also very dark horror comedy. Mm. So it just blends so nicely. And it's cool. It's a different angle because you wouldn't have got that back in the day. They'd be like, you're supposed to do comedy. You should yeah. be doing this. And it's, yeah. it's cool to see different, you know. Just to touch on your point that Chris Rock obviously um, has, I wouldn't say he has beef with the police, but obviously he can be quite political and he's got his own political views. Um if this person is a jigsaw copycat who's killing cops, what kind of political views would Chris Rock have put into that with everything that's gone on in the yeah, last be interesting. sort mm. of 10, 30 years um, within black communities mm. and police? And yeah, yeah. Maybe the killer could be killing black cops. Like, I don't know. Or, I don't know. It'd be inter we'll just interesting we'll see. to see how that dynamic will play out, yeah. which again gives it another layer as yeah, opposed yeah. to just the saw sort of jigsaw. We'll play a game. <laughs> well um, on that note <laughs> thank you guys for listening um, if there's any films that you can think of that are coming out this year that you're highly anticipating please let us know in the comments give us a like please ring the bell to be notified of any more trash arts content coming out within the next few weeks and also subscribe and check out our website it's www.trasharts.co.uk we've got some new stuff up on there we've got um, t-shirts that you can buy mugs well hoodies loads of things check it out you'll enjoy that and uh thanks for listening guys trash arts take out Bye -bye. Bye -bye.